We are very grateful, everyone, for you joining us today. I'm Renee Goki, and I'm the Teacher Services Coordinator at the museum. I'm a citizen of the Eastern Shawnee Tribe of Oklahoma on my paternal side of my family, and I'm Ukrainian and English on my mother's side. Hako Wesila Samamo means, how are you breathing? And actually, until recently, I sort of thought it was just a general um, greeting of how you are, but I learned um, that it means, how are you breathing? And I think that for me, Personally, this has taken on um, a new meaning during these times, during COVID and also um, during, you know, time outside, just thinking about the role that plants and trees have in our, in, in our every breath. And so um, that is, is an important um, part of recognizing and honoring the role that my plant relatives have in, a, in our daily life and in our survival. So thanks for being here, NeoA. In our programs, we start with a land acknowledgement. So we gratefully acknowledge the native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we gather, such as the Piscataway and Anacostan or Natchitoches Tank people who are um, the indigenous peoples of the Maryland and DC region, as well as many diverse and vibrant native people who make their homes here today. As I um, mentioned before, I wish to show respect to the original peoples of these lands and also show gratitude to the land itself. For many Indigenous people, belonging is deeply tied to our ancestral homelands through relationships created over millennia, memories, cultural experiences. In the United States, people are increasingly doing land acknowledgements, which can be spoken or written and are meant to recognize the Indigenous peoples on whose land we stand. These acknowledgements should be motivated by genuine respect for and support of Native peoples. And I believe that's why you're here today. So we hope to go um, deeper in this session today. These are a first step, and you'll hear me say that more than once, in creating ongoing, collaborative, accountable relationships with Indigenous nations and communities. And we hope to support you in building those relationships and knowing where to turn. Many of you already likely do, and I'm seeing in the chat um, land acknowledgements, um, and, and I think that's that's wonderful. And some of you uh, may need additional guidance or, or you're here maybe to learn about it for the first time. So we've developed a one page handout that my colleague will put in the chat. So I wanna talk a little bit about why we're here today. American history and contemporary life often leave out native voices and perspectives, rendering native people invisible or relegated to the past as evidenced by numerous studies of standards and the museum's own textbook studies, um, we, we found, for example, that 87% of the US standards only talk about native people before 1900. And that's a study from Dr. Sarah Shear. So we often cite her study. This land acknowledgement workshop seeks to work towards social justice through the recognition of native peoples as the original stewards of this land and as contemporary people today. We hope that these values and knowledge systems can lead us towards more life affirming practices and relationships that bring balance to the land and water. So our learning objectives today, we hope that you'll learn some new things, that you'll deepen your understandings uh, that lead towards more meaningful changes in your classroom practice, of course, but also maybe a little bit in your daily life. So um, teachers will Consider how to give an intentional and purposeful land acknowledgement in your classroom as a first step towards continual support of Indigenous peoples. Understand the importance of a genuine land acknowledgement for students and Native communities, recognizing that true support of Native people depends on action. And finally, we're going to introduce you to the Essential Understandings Framework and some key concepts that may help you in your own effort to enact a land acknowledgement and frame your uh, teaching in the classroom. So what is a land acknowledgement? Well, today land acknowledgements are used by native peoples and non-native peoples to recognize the original stewards of the lands that we live on. They're used uh, mostly in the American continent, you know, in Canada and the United States, and also in Australia and New Zealand. They can be written or spoken and are stated at the beginning of important events. They provide an opportunity for people of any ancestry to gather together to recognize the rich history and culture of the lands, native nations, and the home we share. I'd like to ask you to take a, 
to just take a moment to reflect on what brought you here today. So this is not something you necessarily have to put in the chat. It's just a quick self-reflection. Think about kind of your intention for coming today and what brought you here. I believe that land acknowledgements can begin by telling a more complete truth of the colonial history of the land that we're on and waking us up to realize that we are mostly uninvited guests on this land. Colonialism, government policies such as broken treaties and settlers took land that belonged to the indigenous peoples of the Americas. These histories are still visible today when you look for them. And in so many cases, policies and broken treaties have kept indigenous people from stewarding their ancestral lands or barely having access to any lands at all. Land acknowledgements can be your first step to acknowledging this history and recognizing that you have a role that can help correct historical injustices of the past and make the effort to understand that a more honest history uh, needs to include native perspectives. So why do we practice them? Well, land acknowledgements can be used as a moment for people to come together, as I mentioned. Um, and while everyone is encouraged to participate in the honoring of a land's history, it can be particularly significant for native people, especially kids, to hear their tribe's name and heritage acknowledged by others. When I showed the first screen of the land acknowledgement, I placed a picture of my own children in that screen um, because essentially a lot of native kids in our region, I live in the DC metro area, um, are essentially invisible in the classroom. There's just not a lot of native kids, but they are there. Um, so that can be really powerful for them to hear and be recognized. Native people developed alongside their homelands for thousands of years, learning to how to become stewards of the land and by building spiritual connections with the environment. A culture's customs, food practices, burial grounds, sacred sites, art traditions, and so forth is tied to the land, including, very importantly, language. A respectful recognition of that relationship can be powerful for all of us, really, to hear. In an educational setting where you work and where new ideas are fostered, teachers giving land acknowledgements can be a powerful way for Native American kids to feel seen and recognized as the original peoples. There's also a, the support side of this. So support um, can play a role towards developing an awareness of uh, a relationship that you can build with, with Native people themselves. So you might start with your students doing research into their own school or town. And I want to mention now that it's okay if you dig, as you dig into the research, you generate more questions and um, you build curiosity with your class because some of this um, can be a little bit um, messy, right? History, uh, and we'll talk about it more, it can be messy. So maybe some of you are here to, you know, uh, look for more straightforward answers, but kids can really have a role in uh, uncovering what might be, what might seem like hidden history around them. Further, there's ideas that you could establish a Native American advisory group in your school, bring in Native presenters um, to speak about Native topics, or, or use the lessons and resources on Native Knowledge 360, where there's a lot of quotes and videos, and you could stream those voices in that way. Um, I'll provide a few examples, as I said earlier, after the workshop of organizations and universities that might become an inspiration for you. Um, and one that I particularly want to highlight is um, Texas Christian University. They um, have a land acknowledgement, but also they've developed a native advisory group. They have really incredible seminars um, that are available online on important topics such as missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, and all of these are really run by um, and the decision making is in collaboration with native that native advisory group. As a K-12 teacher, you may decide to attend one of their online talks as well. And there's many people doing great work on this, um, on land acknowledgements and, and other important topics. So land acknowledgements are not new to Native people. Native nations from throughout the Americas have for centuries practiced different ways of acknowledging the host or the people who live on the land. In the Pacific Northwest, for example, Native nations would and still do visit their neighbors on canoes. They announce themselves from the sea and they ask permission before coming ashore. Traditionally, people would bring gifts and food items to establish good relationships with the home community. This protocol recognized the land tenure and stewardship of different native nations 
and occurs throughout the Pacific Northwest today, as I mentioned. This centuries old practice of respect is echoed differently throughout many Native nations. Well, I have an example, um, and it's maybe a different way of looking at things, but there have been, I've heard of different examples um, from around the world, but I have one um, here in the Americas. So here we see a historical photo, and sorry that I don't have a contemporary one, because certainly um, grass dances still occur today, but this is a photograph from our collection from 1909 of the Bigani or Blackfoot people. And Blackfoot people are from Canada, um, and black feet people are from the United States. So there, I still have some curiosity and some questions about this photograph and the flag um, and, and things like that. But um, I was told by a friend who does grass dance that traditionally this dance was used to sort of um, ready the land and, and push and gra um, dance the grass down in order to get people ready to come together in a, in a meaningful gathering. Um, I've seen uh, a few other examples around the world, in, including Native Hawaiians, when they had the hokulea, which was the um, very uh, traditional Polynesian uh, voyaging vessel that went around the world. It was sharing a message of malama honua, or um, caring for the earth. And the voyagers would always oli, or chant, before they arrived, and then also um, people would um, welcomed them in and they worked with indigenous peoples when they got um, when they came ashore. So there are um, many examples around the world. Only in the last few years have land acknowledgments been really broadly applied though by uh, non-native organizations. So theaters have reached out, many schools, and even yoga studios across the United States. And so that's kind of where this workshop came from. It's just so many requests these public statements are increasingly common and they're meant to communicate solidarity with the injustice endured by indigenous peoples. Unfortunately, some of these statements can appear performative if the person or organization only wants to sort of get on board, um, we say sometimes check the box and recite these statements without an understanding of their significance. Land acknowledgements should not be done just to be part of a trend. Make sure it's not an empty and disconnected practice through self-reflection and research. And how can we know the difference? Performative types of support are often doing something for showmanship or credit, publicly often only attending sort of happy events. But when serious events occur, maybe people don't show up for those important events that are difficult. Uh, they might center more on you and how you're perceived publicly or something like that rather than the people themselves. So allyship is real and genuine. It's continuous and it really centers on the indigenous people um, themselves. So we're gonna dive into our essential understandings, which is a tool to inspire and frame the development of a land acknowledgement. You might wanna use this tool, um, our essential understandings and some of the key concepts to guide your thinking and teaching about American Indians. So I've chosen a few key concepts today to walk through with you that can help. So the first one is our essential understanding number one about American Indian cultures. And it's that native people continue to fight to maintain the integrity and viability of indigenous societies. So when writing your acknowledgement or referring to native peoples, begin with understanding that native people are still very much here today. American Indian history and American history is one of cultural persistence creative adaptation, renewal, and resilience. And I think that extends not only to American Indians, but really to all of us as immigrants have come to this country. It's always been a very um, uh, vibrant culture that we find ourselves in and multicultural. Native individuals, groups, and institutions have and continue to resist oppression and protect their heritage. Native people can speak for themselves. So be careful never to speak for or represent indigenous communities and seek out their diverse voices. When you're writing, um, remember if, even if you wanna talk historically, remember also to write in the present tense. Um, and if you do need to refer to historical groups, it's important to always provide context to the time you are referencing. 
Otherwise, you may be repre representing native cultures as not living, even though it's very likely native people are on the land that you live on today. Maybe they're different native people, but nonetheless, and especially in big cities. Uh, for example, my family uh, moved outside of Portland, Oregon, and this is a relocation city where many native families moved to find jobs in the 1950s. There was actually a 1956 US law intended to encourage American Indians to leave reservations if they had them or traditional lands to assimilate into the general population in urban areas. So cities like New York City and Los Angeles and Minneapolis have very large native populations. So in other words, native people are still here and very much all around you. That's a poster called We the Resilient. American Indian history is not singular or timeless. So most land acknowledgements refer to people who lived in a particular place at the time of European arrival, but that's not where our history begins. American Indians have lived in the Western Hemisphere and it depends on sort of which archeologists and which new uh, research is out, but for at least 15 to 20,000 years. And despite what the textbooks say, most of us in our traditional ways do not subscribe to the Bering Strait theory, although that's often taught in textbooks. We have our own stories of how we emerged as a distinct people on this land and who we are. As you dig into local history, work towards putting specific groups of people in a time period and know that the history is complicated and became more so with the influx of thousands of people and new governments who sought native lands and forced changes upon our diverse people. History is messy and it's okay to generate more questions and leave some unanswered with your students as you embark on understanding more and thinking like historians. Even I see in this simple photograph um, that unfortunately we don't have the girl's name and tribe, which I encourage you to do include if you ever use photographs, so I apologize for that. But I can tell that even this picture of her and her regalia, you know, it's obviously a very contemporary picture of her. Um, but that the feathers that she has, likely macaw feathers, represent pre-contact trade. So all of these things, even in a modern context, have a tradition and have symbolism and reflect history. And often the history can reflect our interaction with each other. Um, so there are often many tribes that may be affiliated with your particular land. Also, I see that she has what I am guessing are uh, likely replica elk teeth. Um, as elk became less accessible to her people, um, she, you know, people have had to move to replica elk teeth, but it still represents by wearing them a relationship that, that is thousands of years old and um, centers around values such as generosity and respect. Uh, you likely know this, but names change over time too. And the name that the Native Nation is using may be different from the name that they're most commonly known by or that colonizers gave them, of course. One example is the Pueblo of Okeyawinge, formerly San Juan Pueblo, and that's a name that reflects their history and interaction with the Spanish in their lands in New Mexico. In my tribe, the Shawnee, we actually call ourselves um, amongst each other Shawana, which means warm or moderate weathered people. And that's a name that you know most of us will probably continue to use Shawnee um, outwardly, but as we learn our language more um, and and reclaim that, maybe younger generations will uh, will use that name more. So it kind of it, it reflects just a little bit deeper of a um, understanding of who we are. A lot of tribes are reclaiming the names that they call themselves, and you should always strive to use those when you learn of them and whenever you can. So the, uh, the other essential understanding is long before their contact with Europeans, indigenous people populated the Americas and were successful stewards and managers of the land. So native people have always and continue to have powerful relationships with the land that sustains them. The story of American Indians in the Western hemisphere is intricately intertwined with places and environments. They understood and valued the relationship between local environments and cultural traditions and actually developed them from the land itself. This didn't change when Native nations were forced from their homelands. Throughout their histories, Native groups have relocated and successfully adapted to new places and environments. Native people continue to care for land both of ancestral origin when they're able 
and of contemporary land holdings. Here you see a picture of the saguaro cactus. The Tana Otham people of the Sonoran Desert or current day Arizona and Northern Mexico have deep and inter interdependent relationships with it. They eat the fruits, they use the flowers, the seeds, the thorns and the ribs for many uses. And they even have a story that the saguaro was once a human being. So I think that a, a picture really helps to tell that story. And that's just one example of many. The final essential understanding, and then I will stop talking for a little bit, is that Native people resisted removal. So, you know, we can't talk about land acknowledgments without at least mentioning removal and dispossession of land. So a variety of political, economic, legal, and military policies were used by Europeans and later Americans to remove and relocate American Indians and to destroy our cultures. The ramifications of these policies are visible today and have occurred since 1492 at the very beginning of contact. After 1492, American Indians or native peoples suffered diseases and catastrophic events that resulted in death on a large scale. Due to the nature of removal, most indigenous peoples, nations and communities don't reside on the land which they have ancestral ties. Native people resisted these policies of removal and cultural erasure, often through diplomatic action or military resistance. A devastating displacement uh, policy, uh, you probably have heard of it and taught about it in your classroom if you have the um, you know, fifth, sixth grade students and maybe um, high school is the Indian Removal Act of 1830, a law signed by Andrew Jackson that forcibly displaced over 100,000 native peoples from their homes. And this is a march commonly known as a Trail of Tears, but we always say there were many trails of tears. In my tribal community, the Shawnee, we are one of 33 or so, depending on the historian you're speaking with, um, forcibly removed tribes under President Jackson's policy. You see a picture here, though, of Katakahasa or Black Hoof, who resisted removal by adopting white dress and farming practices and he would not sign the removal treaty. We had a reservation in Ohio. Unfortunately, after he died, and there's some stories that he was up to 100 years old, the government quickly came in and forced us off of our ancestral lands and reservations in Ohio, where we were separated from our ancestors, our homelands, our family um, graves, and our ceremonial places and foods. However, all three of the federally recognized Shawnee tribes today reside in Oklahoma, hundreds of miles from our homes, uh, and we've made a new home there today. So if you're a person in a region where indigenous people were involuntarily displaced due to federal policy or other means, we encourage you to show a map like this and teach about your specific state or region's people who were forcibly removed from there. And this is not certainly a comprehensive map. This is just showing um, the tribes under the Indian removal policy. And I hope this just, just by seeing this, I think it kind of expands people's ideas beyond the, the Southeast, which a lot of people are aware of, um, but don't know about um, these many other tribes that were also forcibly removed. And you can find these on our NK360 removal lesson. If you haven't used it already. So I wanna turn it back to you and ask, um, can you provide an example of displacement today? And it doesn't have to be American Indians, of course, it can be any example of displacement. And for some of you, if you feel comfortable, um, why is it important to acknowledge displacement around the world? Hurricane victims, yes, I was thinking of the same. Afghanis, gentrification, Haitian migrants, urban renewal, wars, Palestinians, Latin America, Rohingya, the Uyghurs, Nicaragua, residential schools, Cubans. This is making me feel emotional. It, and this is human history, right? People have always have migrated, sometimes by force, sometimes um, by choice. So people are being impacted by forced migration and displacement today. As many of you mentioned, South Africans, apartheid, yes. Eastern Ukraine, the Holocaust. I feel like it's powerful just to say these. So historically and contemporarily, people have been forcibly removed or displaced due to um, sometimes it's necessity for to survive, 
And other times it's been um, people of power who have you know, forced people out or provided conditions that are unlivable. I think it's important to acknowledge displacement and recognize the, the actions taken against our fellow human beings that will help to allow us to develop into more thoughtful and empathetic human beings. So this is this is powerful. I haven't never given this workshop. So and it, it's it's painful. I mean, when you actually think about these things um, and really come to terms with that, we often most of us, including, you know, my family are on these lands that um, that were often taken by force. Right. And so that's an important, a really important place to start in your own personal journey, I think. So um, they start with first acknowledging that we all live on land that sustains us. So honoring the land itself. Second, you need to know who to acknowledge. And as I mentioned in the essential understandings, this, you know, it's not always very totally straightforward. So um, there is a good place to start, though. I want to give some solutions. So um, I recommend the site nativeland.ca. This site's a product of Native Land Digital, and it's an indigenous-led not-for-profit organization. So from learning the names of local groups, you may be able to incorporate Native perspectives and, and go back to those sources of information. And of course, bringing in the primary sources, as I mentioned, and going to tribal websites are important, important places to remember to go. Okay. So there may be Native authors, too, who've written books about your area. Um, I mentioned that poetry, I think, is a really wonderful way um, to connect more deeply to the land. And there's some amazing Indigenous poets. And Joy Harjo's project, if you haven't seen it, on the Library of Congress website is, is really um, a valuable, I think, teaching tool. So I'll, we'll, sh we'll share that after the workshop. You might check out Native artists, contemporary artists, and just bring in new and fresh ways to provide Native perspectives in your research. So your research may take time and not be completely straightforward. You'll probably find that many Native groups have a connection to your area, each with extensive histories and sovereign rights. For example, in my tribe today, one of my relatives is our Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, and because of Shawnee, both um, we moved our homes seasonally um, I always joke we had summer and winter homes, um, but also, you know, through um, interaction with other tribes and with colonial governments and, and participating in different sides of wars and our early history of um, with the, you know, French and the English and the Americans, um, we have 20 documented traditional uh, places or 20 states, I'm sorry, 20 states with documentation of our traditional homeland. So our tribal historic preservation officer um, my relative D spends a lot of time working with so many. So it's I, I say this to say that that you know tribes did move, and especially with the influx, you know people were put on one another's land and things with the influx of um, colonists. That it can be a little bit complicated. So when you come across accounts and stories, they might favor Euro American perspectives and Western research, of course. So um, this drawing, for example. Uh, I think is a counterpoint to that because it shows Shawnee home life in 1921, I believe. And the home and lifestyle that you see here, it doesn't really fit the stereotype of what anthropologists thought real Indians should live like. So underneath the superficial look of, you know, the log cabin and things like that, we might not have, we might have moved into log cabins, <clears throat> excuse me, in the later 1700s, but underneath all of that, um, Shawnees, we still have our traditional games that are seasonal and tied to ceremonies. We have our clan system. We have our um, names that show our clans. We still have many of our songs and dances and ceremonies. And we're really proud of the fact that we've been able to maintain these things, even though maybe on the outside, superficially, um, we might not look uh, Native American or, or live in teepees or anything like that, which we never did. Um, so it's important to, to recognize that the perspective of the historical document that you're looking at may very much be a Euro-American perspective. And it's important to kind of dig into indigenous um, research as well. It may be a little bit challenging in the beginning, but um, I think it will be really meaningful for you and that we have some resources to support you. 
So you may have embarked on a research path on the history of your region's land. And I know many of you are in different places uh, in, your, in your journey. Um, but how do you, you know, then start to maybe put pen to paper, maybe you walk outside and, and have a, a journal or something to start to write one of these. Well, this graphic that we developed stands for um, active actions that you can use to kind of measure your progress. Um, these terms are key factors to ensuring that your a land acknowledgement is meaningful to you and to Native people. So uh, first you have to, of course, start with the land itself and acknowledge that, um, that we all live and rely on it for our, our lives. The second step is to listen to and learn from and continuously include Native people and their perspectives. Uh, both in your acknowledgement and hopefully in your school more. The third step when you're in the process is language. So remember to use clear, respectful, and intentional language and be willing to adjust it as you learn more. Some, in fact, during the beginning of this workshop, people were sending me land acknowledgements and I thought there were some great examples. And then a colleague, Eric, he actually sent an updated one. So he continually, he checked in with an elder and then updated it again. So there's so many examples of making this an ongoing process. And finally, uh, offer genuine and continuous support to native communities and ask how you might learn more or support land issues in your area. So if you keep these four steps in mind and maybe you'll develop another one, I'd be curious and welcome uh, any feedback. That um, I think could be uh, a good start in creating accountable and respectful relationships um, with the land and with the indigenous people from there and working more towards justice. So one of the big points that I wanted to bring um, up is to not stop with the land acknowledgement and consider that you've done your part. So true reconciliation and relationship building requires ongoing effort and practice. So we encourage you to strive toward, towards building a classroom dedicated to social justice, which I know many of you already do and are leaders on those efforts. You might incorporate NK360 quotes, objects, images. We have videos, podcasts, and you know the social justice books that Teaching for Change does. And many of the presenters today have wonderful resources and are writing books on topics that you can bring into your classroom. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to stop talking for a minute and ask where you feel inspired to start, because I know many of you are in maybe different places. Maybe you already do them. Um, maybe some of you, you know, some people have told me I started them, but I, I feel like words aren't enough and wanted a next step. So anybody feel comfortable sharing where they feel inspired to start? Teaching my second graders the name of the lands we're on. That's great. Yes. And what they mean often, like um, Piscataway, for example, means people of the blended water. So where the fresh water and the salt water meet are the places where they have their traditional homes. Teaching pre-service teachers. Learn about displacement. Oh my gosh, you have so many good ideas. Everybody has such great ideas. I'm excited to go back through this chat. That's great. Excellent. I'm, I'm trying to read all of these. Don't put the burden on indigenous educators. Yes, good point. Some of you mentioned you want to see a good model or example. We'll share those. But really, um, what I've come to realize, and I think, is that it really takes a certain amount of personal reflection and you know, a walk or time you know, on the land yourself is, is my view. Um, but, you know, you want it to be authentic to you. So some of you may say, you know, I'd, I'd rather be more oriented towards just social justice and bringing Native voices in, and I don't feel comfortable with reciting a land acknowledgement. That's, that's okay. I mean, you know, that's, that's part of being authentic. Um, and so this is an exploration of your interaction with the land around you. It may be a work in progress. I think it always is. We always are as teachers. Um, your statement might simply be, I recognize that I'm on Indigenous land and we'll make an effort to learn more, which some of you said, I think that's a really great start, a very important step. So be sure to make room for discomfort, depending on where you are in the process. It may be challenging and uncomfortable for you because these are actually seemingly simple ideas, but they're not simple. And um, it, it's, it's in some ways crazy that this is considered like a radical act, right? To, to, name the people that are from there to, you know, acknowledge this history. Um, but I think that, you know, we can get a lot 
from everybody here on ideas. Thank you. So I have, uh, you know, one that I'd be happy to share, personal one that I'd be happy to share later. It's just one example. It's very personal, um, but it really came from, and I've seen other examples of really acknowledging the native plants that are from here, the particular waters, the Nipi, all the creeks here, and um, even, you know, some of the dirtier areas too, right? I'm in an urban uh, area. All of this, um, you know, it looked different. And it, you know, now it might be covered in, in streets and drain pipes and um, other things, but uh, there is still presence of, um, of these things and we can have a role in, in helping them. And one of the ways that I do this is by planting native plants. Um, so I give them out to neighbors and support native pollinators. Um, and I really have been involved lately with Homegrown National Park and creating butterfly ways and um, just doing a lot to, to turn what would be a lawn area or others and, and kind of organizing, supporting other people in their efforts to, to have native plants in their area. So uh, these are fantastic. I really appreciate all of your ideas. Thank you. There's just a picture of some of the plants and things I've been growing indigenous foods right in my front yard. So this is sort of like the first question. Um, I'm, I'm seeing all of your ideas here. That's great. Um, but what is one action that you might take today? I mean, it's a beautiful day here and I'm in my basement, <laughs> but I'm looking forward to going outside and I wonder if anybody feels like there's something small. I mean, you're here, so that's a great step and that that is um, fantastic and we really appreciate you being here. Um, is there another idea that anybody might want to share? It's like one thing that they might do today. And maybe it's, you know, read a book or I have an idea here I could share maybe. Um, this was shared by Bert Correa, who works on our education staff. You saw Bert. Um, and I thought this was really nice. So maybe you'll go outside and uh, take a photo by your home or wherever you're kind of zooming in from today. You could add a caption with details about the Indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. right? It might take a little research, or maybe this will be in another day or two. Um, we're going to see how this goes. So you can add the NK360 LA tag to it, LA for land acknowledgement for short. Um, so this is one way that, um, you know, you might start and you can see Bert's example here. It's a ceremonial center in Taino territory because he's Taino and uh, from Puerto Rico. So his, his lands are, are there, his traditional lands. So I want to thank Bert for sharing that example. Um, I wanted to acknowledge just a couple other ideas um, because I don't pretend that the museum um, is the, you know, we're not the only people doing this work. Um, there's a lot of other people that are doing great work around this and I encourage you to seek out their voices and perspectives. Um, so there's some great workshops that are even upcoming. Uh, so explore more. And I heard in the chat, I wanted to recognize this point that somebody made um, that yes, I know many of you may want to bring a native presenters into your classroom. I think that's great. But remember that um, we might also, what is our role in supporting indigenous peoples by lifting kind of the burden of education off of their shoulders. So, you know, continue to read, continue to talk to people, um, but, and go to different web websites. Like, um, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the land back movement. Um, there's a, a really great website we can share um, where they're pursuing, you know, a more active uh, environmental and social justice movement to actually return land back to Native people. Um, you can read about their recent land back campaign that launched in, on Indigenous Peoples Day uh, last year in 2020 that seeks to dismantle systems of oppression. So they're really seeking to coordinate efforts to put public lands back into Indigenous hands. So that's one, you know, one example, and there are many out there. So I want to close by saying, Nia Wei, thank you for spending time with me. This is the first time we've done this workshop, and I learned an awful lot. 